Hi there and welcome to lecture two for Biostats. So today we're going to be looking at qualitative data. So you remember these two major data types, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data are basically numeric measures, uh, while qualitative data are labels or categories of some kind. So we're looking at how we can summarize qualitative data using tables uh, and bar charts and perhaps pie charts. And then we'll go on to um, a typical use of uh, qualitative data, uh, which are um, determining probabilities and things from from tables, and then we'll look specifically at sensitivity and specificity of diagnostic tests. So you remember that these two types of data uh, of data: the quantitative, numeric measures, which are usually which are often uh, continuous data, so that they can have uh, you know as many decimal places as you like, uh, potentially, or they could be um, large counts as well and typically we summarize those uh, using things like the mean, the median, uh, the range um, or using graphs like histograms, uh, density plots or box plots. Qualitative data on the other hand are um, categorical data or grouping data. Sometimes we call them factors. Okay so that's kind of the technical term that the software uses um, and um, typically they're, they're things um, that group things together in some way. So things like gender um, would probably be categorical, although perhaps some might argue it's continuous. Um, you know, many other things, um, you know, have categories. Is the door open or shut? Right, that's a category. And for summaries of qualitative data, so for categorical data, essentially um, the easiest way to summarize is to basically count the number of observations in each category. Um, and then once you've done that, you can either present the table um, of counts or frequencies um, in the form of a table um, or instead of counts you might want to use proportions or percentages in each category that's another way that you can do it um, and of course you can also um, present that same tabular information in graphical form with as a bar chart or perhaps as a pie chart in the case that um, you know the things make up a whole or 100% total um, one thing you've got to be careful of um, in when you're using R Studio is to make sure that R is correctly interpreting the um, the variable as a factor, and this is particularly the case when the when the data you have might be numeric, so it might be count data, or it might be something like, uh, for example, the body condition score, um, which is new, you know it's a numeric it's a number, and by default R will treat the number as if it's continuous data, even though it's actually a grouping variable. Okay, so um, so you just got bit, that's something just to be careful of when you're using the software, and we'll we'll show you how to do that in the in the uh, laboratory exercises. Okay, so we'll start with some examples of good and bad um, charts and tables. This is um, very clearly a, a very bad table, um, and it's bad for a number of reasons. Um, the first thing that's kind of obviously bad is that there's way too much information in this table in terms of the amount of precision uh, for each of the numbers. So you can see here that we've got, essentially we've got a, a number here, 75.04. So this is um, in millions of years, okay, uh, 75.04. But then this, um, these numbers in brackets here are sort of the uncertainty associated with this number. Right, so 75.04, that's our best guess, but it could be anywhere between 66.85 and 84.41. Clearly, given that there's a range of almost 20 million years here, we don't need the decimal places, right? We don't need the decimal places on any of these numbers at all. So the very first thing we should do with this table to make it nicer is to get rid of all of the uh, precision in the numbers that are just it's basically completely meaningless. Um, the other thing that makes this bad is that um, what you're really wanting to do here is compare across the columns. That's the useful comparison. The down the column is not useful um, in this case because they're actually comparing completely different things. Across the column is what you're wanting to kind of um, compare. And it's very easy for us to tell differences down the column because that's kind of, you know, they're all lined up vertically, we can compare them very easily, it's much harder to compare across. So one thing that I think would make this a lot better is if it was switched around the other way, right? So you just had three rows and multiple columns. Now that might be hard, 
given their the amount of space on the page but i think another way to present this data would have been you know the actual numbers the values here aren't all that important okay it's the magnitude probably that's the bigger you know importance and so you could present these as as perhaps a dot chart so you had um your node here along the x-axis 1 through 25 and then you had a dot at the height um you know a dot at 75 here a dot at 39 for the next one and so on and then you could perhaps use a line to indicate the uncertainty and that would be a much better presentation of this type of data so just think about when you're making a table how you know can you can you simplify it how can you reduce the amount of noise in the table so that the signal in the table is more clear so here's an example um, we'll just wait for it to kind of get back to the start of taking a table that is quite noisy and making it better okay so um, it's looping back now right so here we go here's the original table this one here and you can see that there's a lot of information and so what the, the uh, this uh, animation shows is going through the process of getting rid of some of the noise some of the uh, unnecessary detail in the table that is taking away from the signal of the table the key um, sort of points that you want the reader to take out of the table and often a lot of software packages do tables really poorly by default so excel for example and word for example you know their default sort of theming if you like the background and the number of lines they use and all that sort of stuff is um, is not conducive to a nice readable table and you can see here that once you remove a lot of the information sort of round the numbers and so on things things are, are a lot better so here's the before table and here's the after table and you can see it's much more readable so just think about that when you make a table you know how how can you uh, change the aesthetic layout of it in order to make it easier to read for people um, now pie charts are generally something that i don't recommend um, just because there's sort of a narrow range of um, applications for which they make sense and generally people are fairly poor at judging the differences between angles um, compared to judging uh, differences between lengths so a bar chart where you distinguish um, you know height differences across different groups is much easier for us to do than to compare angles particularly when those uh, those angles start getting really similar okay for example these here um, these two angles here are, are essentially the same to the eye we only know that they're different due to the numbers right um, and maybe that's actually what we want to show in which case it's fine um, but you know just think about it if you do want to show that one group's bigger than the other and they're very close together then you will not see that in a pie chart you have to look at a bar chart there are some cases where pie charts are, are better and we'll, we'll see some of those this is clearly a really extremely bad pie chart um, I mean the very first thing we do is we notice that these numbers don't add up to 100% right if you're using a pie chart um, because it's in a pie you're assuming that it's portions of the whole and if they don't add up to 100% it makes no sense okay um, here's obviously a good pie chart right um, it's an actual pie for for example um, and you know it does does add up to the whole right you have the pie you haven't eaten uh, you haven't eaten and the pie you have eaten and clearly they those two things add up to to the entire pie uh, bar charts um, are typically better but can be very bad so this is uh, what uh, Facebook analytics looks like so if you've got a Facebook page um, for example for a um, you know a shop or something um, then one of the things you want to look at is um, sort of you know who is interacting with your page in order to p potentially target advertisements and so on at, at others and um, this is a poor bar chart because it combines too much information on the same plot it's trying to combine two things on the same too many things on the same plot you can see here um, for example that the numbers here are clearly different to the bars right this num you know this bar is supposed to be 53 percent and this bar is supposed to be 57 percent yet they're clearly different in length you know they should be about the same if they were actually that value and the reason for this is that actually the percentages here 
are within the green group. The heights are the number of people. So in this particular uh, website, the demographics that go to this website, this Facebook page, are more weighted uh, towards women than men. So they're much uh, more women uh, go to this website than men, which is why all of the green bars tend to be higher. The percentages then are within the green. So within the green bars, 57% of them are in the 18 to 24 age group. Okay, So this is poor because it's trying to combine two things on the same chart. Okay, and it's then you know, making both of those things confusing. Um, if you're wanting to compare percentages, then you should have your height being in percentage. So instead of the scale, it should be a percentage scale, whereby this blue one should, would be way higher. Okay. However, by comparing the percentages, you then don't get, you wouldn't get the sense that the uh, women were much uh, more frequently going to this website than men are. Right, so there's two different things that you're comparing. You're comparing the breakdown of the women and men separately, and then you're comparing the breakdown of gender across all people. Um, and those two things are different. You should present them in different charts. Okay. Um, here's here's one that was on the news the other day. So this is, um, of course, about coronavirus testing. I think it was on TVNZ. Um, and you can see here that this is, you know, they've obviously haven't used an actual piece of statistical software to produce this chart because you can see here that this last bar here 5053 is supposed to be the number but it's lower than this bar here okay I think the other bars are probably probably okay um, this bar here is at about the same height as the 7000 and they're essentially the same so they're probably actually okay but this one here is clearly wrong it should be higher okay so just be careful um, when you see data presented uh, that it is in fact accurate. Okay, uh, this isn't actually too bad. It's you know near enough to the same height, but um, you know there's been some real shockers, um, particularly if there's a if there's kind of a um, if there's perhaps a political point or or sort of motivation behind um, you know showing data that suits a particular narrative. Um, it's you know, it doesn't take much of a point if you have a, a, a narrative that you're trying to push to sort of manipulate the chart a little bit in order to make it look better for your narrative. So what makes a good summary for categorical data? Typically, it depends on what your purpose is. If you only have a few numbers that you want to show and the numbers that are important, then a table is usually best because a table will show you the actual numbers. However, a bar chart is usually faster for visual comparison. One of the key points, of course, with a bar chart is it should always start at zero because of the fact that you're comparing length, right? So you want the length to be proportional to the value. And the only way that happens is if it starts at zero. Typically, my advice is to not use pie, ch pie charts. Um, the software that we use actually makes it quite hard to make a pie chart, which you know sort of helps in this regard. Um, if it's hard to do, you won't do it. Um, but if you if there are some cases where they are useful, I'll show you a case in a moment. Um, but just make sure that when you do do that, um, the percentages add up to a hundred. And lastly, make sure you keep them simple. So keep your your charts uh, plain without a whole bunch of decoration that is kind of distracting to the user. So here's an example um, where we took one hundred people and we. Uh, counted the number of people with each sort of eye color. Okay, so there's a, there's a range from blue through to brown. Um, and you can see we can present that data in three different ways. We've got the table here with the actual numbers. Uh, we've got a pie chart because these things add up to 100%. It makes sense. And we have a, a, have a bar chart as well. And I think, um, you know, they each have advantages and disadvantages. So the disadvantage of the, of the table is it's, is it's hard to compare directly. Um, it's not too bad in this case, there's only five numbers. But the advantage is you get the actual numbers, whereas you, you don't get the actual numbers in the bar chart, but you can instantly compare, right? Most people are either blue or brown, and there's not that many in the middle, and there's slightly more amber than grey, right? So you can see that shape immediately. You can quite easily compare the amber to the grey segment and show see that the amber is a little bit longer than the grey segment. Um, 
but you don't get the actual values, right? You'd have to kind of read across and say, oh, that looks to be about 15. And so amber is maybe a little bit higher, maybe it's 16, right? It's harder to get the actual numbers if you want the actual numbers. Um, the pie chart, um, again, you can see that, um, that the largest, you can easily distinguish the largest segments, the blue and the brown, and that the blue is larger than the brown. It's quite hard to distinguish which ones are bigger between the others. I think I can see that the grey and amber are bigger than the green, but it's very hard for me to tell what's bigger between the grey and the amber, um, other than when I know that the amber is bigger, and then I can kind of see, oh, okay, it is a slightly bigger segment than that one. Uh, the one case where the, where the uh, pie chart tells me something that the others don't is that I can see here that blue and grey is almost half, right, of the total. Whereas that's hard to see on any of the other displays. Okay, like on this one I'd have to add up the numbers and then add up those numbers and see that they're about 50-50. On this one I'd have to kind of estimate the area of these two bars compared to the area of these three. It's quite a hard exercise where it's a very simple thing to do on the pie chart. So if you do have, a, ha, uh, have categories that sort of naturally bunch together and you bunch them together on a pie chart, then you can make big conclusions uh, about uh, sort of overall totals quite easily, particularly if you colour them similarly. Okay, so that's one case here where the where the pie charts actually perhaps um, gives you something that the other ones don't. Obviously, it's got disadvantages in other ways. Um, another key case uh, when we have categorical data is when we have two categorical variables. Okay, in the data. So here's an example of a study. Um, you can click on the link there if you want to know more about it. Uh, where people were asked to assess photographs of um, 40 men and women um, and then asked to uh, rate them for trustworthiness. And there were many things that they asked um, the uh, raters to, um, the, the people to, to rate. Um, and uh, after correcting for things like, you know, they, they scored them for attractiveness and dominance and, you know, how square the face looks and all that sort of stuff. Um, the proportion of those that thought individuals were trustworthy is shown in this table below. And we have two variables. We have their eye color, blue or brown, and we have their trusted or whether they were trusted or untrusted. Okay. And because we've got that, we've broken it down into all of the possible groups. So we've got the um, the people that were trusted that had blue eyes, the people that were trusted that had brown eyes, the people that were untrusted that had blue eyes, and the people that were untrusted that had brown eyes. That's the four possibilities, right? We've got two variables, each with two possibilities. So all up, we've got two times two, four possibilities. We also have the totals here overall. So you can see that there were 40 people with blue eyes, 40 people with brown eyes, 42 of them were trusted, and 38 of them were not, out of 80 total, okay? So when we have a, a, a table like this, this is called a cross tabulation, um, then we can answer questions about um, whether these variables are related to each other or not, or are they dependent on each other in some way. And so one thing to think about is, is trustworthiness related to eye color? Have a think about that. Okay, I think that they are related. And the reason that I think they are related is that I'm sort of comparing um, the numbers and the columns here to each other, sort of in terms of the proportion, right? So here I see that of the blue-eyed people, 14 out of 40 were trusted, whereas out of the brown-eyed people, 28 out of 40 were trusted. Twice the number of brown-eyed people were trusted compared to blue-eyed people. So it seems as though there is a relationship between the um, trusting and the eye color, right? More of the brown-eyed colored people were trusted compared to the blue-eyed colored people. Uh, we can sort of formalize this through the concept of probability. And so we'll introduce the, the, the sort of the basics now. So we use probability every day. Um, we perhaps don't think about it in terms of probability, but we're often rating the things like, you know, the risk of things and the likelihood of things happening. That's all probability. All the probability does is kind of put a number on it. Um, that's essentially all it does and sort of has a bunch of 
uh, rules around how we put numbers on things it sort of formalizes what we tend to do all the time anyway. So for example, the height of bars on a histogram show that the likelihood or the chance that an observation chosen at ran random is within that sort of that small range or bin of values that the bar represents. Um, the weather app on your phone will probably tell you the likelihood of rain today, right? So today um, it's supposed to be sunny all day. So I didn't bother um, packing my wet weather gear for my bike, right? Um, I just, you know, have, have sort of lightweight clothing on today because I don't think it's going to rain. Um, whereas if, it, you know, there was a chance of it raining this afternoon, I would have, you know, put in my wet weather gear, even if it wasn't raining in the morning. Um, you know, we evaluate risk all the time. So right now, you're pr you've probably thought today at some point about, um, you know, what's, what's the chance that we have more cases of coronavirus in the community today, right? Um, you know, you've probably thought about, you know, what's the chance of you getting coronavirus? What can you do to minimise that risk? Okay, there's all that type of thing is that, you know, we think about all the time. Perhaps we don't put specific numbers on it, um, like, you know, my phone does. Uh, you know, it tells me there's a 30% chance of rain at any particular hour or whatever. Um, you know, that, that's putting a number on it, but we, we nonetheless kind of rate things as being um, probable to occur or less likely to occur all the time. Obviously, you know, we do that when we do things like bet on a, on a, a sports match or uh, purchase a lotto ticket, right? There's a small chance of you winning and you add some weight to that based on what, what you think is going to happen, right? Trading off the, the, the likely return and things like that. So how do we do this in a mathematical sense? Well, um, probability essentially signs a, assigns a number from 0 to 1 inclusive, so 0 and 1 are allowed, um, to some event happening, right? So um, uh, basically you're putting a specific number between 0 and 1. So 0 means the event is never going to happen. 1 means the event is always going to happen. Okay, it definitely occurs. And so 0.5 would be it occurs half the time, right? So that's, that's the idea. So um, as you get closer to 0, you're mean, it means it's less likely to, to occur. As you get closer to 1, it means it's more likely to, to occur. Um, in the first part of the paper, in epidemiology, you would have talked about odds, right? Our odds are related to probabilities through this formula here, right? So it's the probability of the thing happening divided by the probability of the thing not happening, okay? Um, so, for example, if you think that something's um, going to happen sort of uh, a quarter of the time, so that the probability would be 0.25, it would be 0.25 divided by 1 minus 0.25, which would be 0.25 divided by 0.75, which is one third. Okay, so the odds would be 1 and 3. All right. Now, there's lots of ways that we can combine probabilities or we can estimate probabilities. Um, and I've got some of them here. So there's the idea of um, objective probability, which is based on a physical model or empirical study. So, for example, that might be... Um, you know, if you think about uh, the probability of a... Um, of a coin um, being heads or tails you can see that a coin um, can be represented essentially as a flat disc right the thickness of it is not particularly important it's highly unlikely to land on its edge um, and because uh, you can assume that the coin is sort of equally weighted one side or the other then the physical characteristics of it suggest that it's um, sort of going to be half and half as to which side lands up Right, so that's kind of based on the physical model. Um, that's objective probability. Frequentist probability is basically just based on history, right? So um, another way to estimate the likelihood of a, of a coin being ahead is to just uh, toss the coin a whole heap of times, right? So toss the coin, say, a thousand times, count the number of heads, and it would be, you know, the number of heads divided by a thousand would be the probability of a head. And, of course, the, the more trials you give, the, the, the sort of the closer the frequentist um, technique will uh, go to the truth. Um, there's also subjective probability. So subjective probability is essentially based on belief or prior um, experience or generalizations. Um, so for example, um, I use subjective probability to assess weather all the time. So while I use the app on my phone to tell me 
um, you know, what it thinks the chance of rain is. I'm also using what I know from um, from previous days, you know, was it raining yesterday? Um, or from what the season is, right? So, you know, if, I, if it's in the, in the spring, then I know that we tend to have um, sort of unexpected rain often in the spring and in the, in the autumn. So um, I'm going to be using that. So even if it says it's going to be, you know, not raining today, I might pack pack my jacket and stuff just in case um, because I know that uh, you know the variation that I've seen in previous years suggests that um, even though it says it may, may not rain um, I want to sort of bank on it um, and so I'm going to sort of back it up by using my prior experience and there's a final school of probability which is essentially combined subjective probability with um, frequentist and the idea is you start with some prior belief and then you update those beliefs with data Okay, and there's kind of a, a bunch of mathematics that shows that this um, can happen quite nicely. Now, we won't be talking about Bayesian probability or subjective probability all that often. We'll mostly be using sort of a, a frequentist idea um, in this course. Okay, so once we now know um, the idea of probability, we can evaluate some. Okay, so um, there's lots of different sort of uh, probabilities that we can evaluate and some of them have special terms So we'll just be going uh, through those over the next few slides So the first question we might ask is what is the probability that a person is trusted? Okay, so notice in the statement uh, We've just um, made a claim about the person's being trusted. We haven't said anything about their eye color So essentially we can ignore the eye color and just use the total column and then assess the trustedness. So the probability that a person is trusted is just going to be the 42 that we're trusted out of the 80 total. Right? Uh, so that's called a marginal probability, um, and that is because we're using the totals in the margin. Okay? And it always happens when you don't care about one of the other variables. So you don't care if they, they had blue eyes or brown eyes. All you care about is were they trusted or not. So you can ignore the eye color variable and just use the total for that instead. Okay, that's a marginal probability. Um, sometimes we have them slightly different. So this is, um, what is the probability that a person with blue eyes is trusted, right? So in this case, we know that the person has blue eyes, right? That's kind of the prerequisite. So we know we're using the blue eye column. Um, and now we want the probability that, that that uh, blue eye people were uh, trusted, we would take the 14 out of the 40. Okay, so that's called a conditional probability because we've worked out the probability that they're trusted conditional on them having blue eyes. Okay, so that's 35%. Previously, we had what did we have before? 53%. Okay. Um, and there's a different type. What is the probability that a trusted person has brown eyes, right? So this is kind of the other way around to the to the one we just had before. So we know that they're a trusted person, so we're just using this row. What's the probability then that they have brown eyes? Then we'd just be taking the 28 out of the 42 total that, that were trusted. So again, that's a conditional probability. And we'll be using 28 out of 42, which is a, a, a two-thirds, isn't it? 67%. And the last type of probability we, we could have is called a joint probability. And that is, uh, what is the probability that a person has brown eyes and is trusted? Right? So you're looking for the word and often in order to determine this. So we want the probability that a person, which is any person, has brown eyes and is trusted. So we will be running it out of the total of 80. Um, and we'll be using the brown eyes and trusted field. So it'll be 28 out of 80. 36%. So that's a joint probability. So a, a marginal probability is when you're ignoring one of the vari variables and using the totals. A conditional probability is when you've specified one of the variables, and so you're just using that column or row. And a joint probability is where you haven't specified anything and you're using a combination, it's a field inside the table, with the global total, right, which is the one... Uh, total of the of the row totals and the total of the column totals okay so we've got a what is the probability the person is trusted that's marginal because we don't specify the eye color 
What is the probability that a person with blue eyes is trusted? We know they have blue eyes, so it's conditional. What is the probability that a trusted person, we know they're trusted, has brown eyes, that's conditional. And what is the probability that a person has brown eyes and is trusted? We've got any old person, but they have to have both the criteria of brown eyes and trusted, that's joint. Okay. And so when we have two variables like that, we can, um, we can ask whether they're related. And the mathematical term for that is dependence. And the opposite to being dependent is being independent. And the mathematical rule is this one here. And uh, this is just sort of the short form for this actual writing down here, which is what we'll be dealing with. We won't really care about the, the mathematical short form. We'll just give it in the, in the long form because who cares about, you know, syntax. Uh, we want ideas, not syntax. So, uh, so this is, uh, what's the probability that A occurs given we know that B occurs? So this is a conditional probability, right? So we know that B occurs. What's the probability that A occurs? Um, is that equal to the probability that A occurs regardless of the state of B? Okay, so if that's the case, so if the probability of A occurring uh, doesn't depend on whether we know B occurs or not, then they're independent. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're comparing the conditional probability that A occurs, conditional on what B, uh, you know, a known state of B, is that the same as the marginal probability that A occurs, ignoring the state of B? Okay, so if the conditional probability is the same as the marginal, then they're independent. If they're not the same, then they must be dependent. So for example, in this case here, we've evaluated a conditional probability and a marginal probability, right? So what's the probability that a person with brown eyes, um, a person has brown eyes given that they're trusted? That's 28 out of 42, right? So we know that they're trusted. Uh, 28 of them have brown eyes, 42 of them total, okay? We note that that's not the same as the probability that they have brown eyes, right? Um, which would be 40 out of 80. And so because 28 out of 42 does not equal 40 out of 80, brown eyes and trustworthiness are not independent, therefore they must be dependent. So trustworthiness is dependent on eye colour, which is the conclusion that we had before, right? When we just looked at the table and we noticed that, um, you know, the proportion of blue-eyed people that were trusted was 14 out of 40, the proportion of brown-eyed people that were trusted was 28 out of 40, those proportions aren't the same, so they must be related in some way. The two variables must be related in some way. Same conclusion, it's just kind of, we've done it from a more sort of mathematical standpoint. Okay, now there's a key area where this type of thing is important and we and we often have to combine conditional probabilities and, and, um, and individual probabilities and that is diagnostic testing. And I think you've already gone through a lot of this but we'll be covering it again sort of from a slightly different angle perhaps from the angle of statistics. So the idea is that no diagnostic test is perfect. Um, it will always produce some false positives and false negatives, right? So for example, we know that the, uh, the COVID-19 test, the, um, the, uh, the nasal swab that you have and then the PCR that's run on it in order to detect uh, um, the viral RNA, we know that that's not perfect. Uh, we, we know it's not perfect for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is it's, is it's um, not perfect in that, in that the swab might not quite um, get any virus, even though you might have it, right? If you're not shedding the virus all that much at the time, then uh, you won't be able to detect it very well. Um, but it's also, um, you know, there's some limit to detection on the virus, on the, on the um, PCR and things. There's, you know, a certain number of um, viral particles that have to be on the swab in order for you to be able to pick it up on the PCR. And so some people that return a negative result for the PCR will in fact have coronavirus and we don't know. This is why we test multiple times, for example, in uh, managed uh, isolation and with the current outbreak they've tested um, close contacts more than once as well in some cases. And similarly the coronavirus test um, isn't perfect in that it can present false positives. Um, now we see that more on um, so it's, m it's a much lower rate for the coronavirus test. Typically, if you see viral, uh, viral RNA in a PCR, then um, you know, th it must have come from somewhere. So unless there was contamination or something, um, it's likely that it was on the swab. But it could actually be um, viral RNA from a past infection. 
So we've seen this in a couple of cases where people have tested positive, um, you know, two or three months after the event. So they're no longer sh shedding um, all that much, uh, you know, high loads of, of virus. They're very unlikely to be infectious to others. Yet we can still pick up that, that you know, there's still some um, hanging around. Okay, so no diagnostic test is perfect. There will always be some false positives and false negatives. We want to characterize those so that we can then um, answer questions about when the test is positive, what should we do? So there's two, two um, typical ways of, um, of kind of characterizing this. Um, that's the that sensitivity and specificity. I'm sure you already know this. So the sensitivity is the probability that they test positive given that they, we know that they have the condition. Okay, so that's the probability of a true positive. Right, so the test says they're positive and they've got the thing that we're looking for. They've got the condition. And that's of course one minus the probability of a false negative. So if it's a true positive, um, then it's not a false negative. A false negative of course would be, um, would be one where the person uh, has the condition but the test returns negative. Okay, so that's the true positive rate. Um, and the other one is the specificity, which is essentially the probability that the, that the test um, returns a true negative, which is one minus the probability that it's a false positive. All right, so um, uh, we know they don't have the condition. So for example, they don't have coronavirus, um, then what's the probability that the test will confirm that for us and say, yes, you're right, they don't have the coronavirus. Uh, typically for, with the coronavirus test, for example, that's very, very high. It's almost one. It's not quite one, obviously. Um, it's not a perfect test, but it's like 0.999 or something like that. There's a very low chance of the test saying you have coronavirus if in fact you don't. Okay, so um, so with diagnostic um, testing, there's, there's, there's errors. There's false positives and false negatives. They're sometimes called a type 1 error and a type 2 error. And this uh, diagram sort of... Um, shows you, you know, gives you a, a sort of a, an amusing uh, way of putting it. So a, a false positive is where the test says you're positive, but in fact you don't have it. And a false negative is where the test says you uh, don't, um, that you're negative, but in fact you do have it. So here we have someone that is um, unlikely to be pregnant, um, yet the doctor is saying that they're pregnant. So the doctor is, is is the test in this case is saying that this, this person's pregnant when in fact we can see that it's probably unlikely that that person is pregnant. Um, on the other hand, we have this one where the doctor is saying that the person is not pregnant when we, you know, the evidence in front of us suggests that perhaps they are pregnant, right? So that's the difference between a type one error and a type two error, a false positive and a false negative. And sort of the weight that we give to each of these depends sort of on the outcome. So, so there's going to be false positives, there's going to be false negatives. Um, um, how we care about them differs depending on the, on the um, implication really. Okay, so for example, with the coronavirus, we don't really care too much um, about false positives, right? Um, because worst case, um, you know, if, if there's a false positive, we'll be saying, hey, you've got the coronavirus when they in fact don't. So what we're going to do is we're going to isolate that person for a couple of weeks. Okay, we're also probably going to um, isolate their contacts uh, for a couple of weeks as well um, and sort of monitor them, those contacts. Those contacts will have to get tested and so on. Um, but at least we're not going to, or we're less likely to, to, um, to get further, further spread of the virus. Whereas a false negative is a big deal, right? With a false negative, we tell a person, hey, you don't have the coronavirus. And so they're going to react to that and then you know, perhaps go out and, um, you know, go to a party or something and potentially spread the coronavirus around, right? A false negative is we say that they don't have it when in fact they do. And that's why when we get a negative test for coronavirus, you're often encouraged to monitor your symptoms and to stay home if there's anything, any issue whatsoever, right? Because we're wanting to, to we know that there's false negatives and we're wanting to limit the, the potential for that. Okay. Um, so the key thing to know about diagnostic testing is that the, um, any diagnostic test will, will tell you typically what the sensitivity and the specificity are associated with the test, but those are things that you typically don't actually want to know, right? So when you want, what you want to actually know is given the test is positive, what's the probability that the animal has a condition, right? So 
uh, an animal comes to see you, all right, you take some bloods, you go away and get some tests done, the test comes back positive. So what you now want to know is, okay, given I've got a positive test, does that mean the animal has the disease? Or is there a chance the animal doesn't have the disease? I, you know, is, because you don't know whether it's a po false positive or a true positive. So what you want is you want the probability that they have the disease given your test result. Okay. And that's not what you have, right? Up here in the sensitivity, you've got the probability that, that, that the test is positive given that they have the condition. Or the test is negative given that they don't have the condition. But we need to switch these around, right? Because what we're interested in is okay, I've got a positive test, what's the probability that they have the disease, right? So that you can then make an informed decision about how you're going to treat that person. So we somehow need to turn around these conditional probability statements. And you can do that if you know the prevalence of the disease. So this is a thing called Bayes' theorem. Um, and there's some crazy formula for it. Well, it's not that crazy, really. It's reasonably straightforward. Um, but we're just going to deal with it by, by basically thinking of a large population and then seeing what happens. So here's an example. We've got a um, we've got feline leukemia virus, or FELV in New Zealand, uh, for cats, of course, has a prevalence of around 4%. And we have a diagnostic test for FELV, which is 97% sensitive and 94% specific. Okay. So these sound like impressive numbers, right? 97% sensitive, 94% specific, so only 3% um, false negatives and 6% false positives. So that sounds pretty good. So given a positive test result, so you have a cat come along, you test it, you go and get a diagnostic test for FELV and it returns positive. Now we want to know, well, what's the chance the cat actually has FELV? So to evaluate that, what we're going to do is we're just going to assume we have a large population of cats and just pick a big number. In this case, I've picked 10,000 and construct a table and fill it in based on the information we have, right? So we're going to have 10,000 total. We're going to have a test positive, test negative column, and we're going to have the condition or no, no condition um, rows. And we're just going to fill in the table based on what we know. So the first thing we know is the prevalence. Right, the prevalence is around 4%. So we know that of the 10,000 cats, 4% of them will have FELV. 4% of 10,000 is 400, and so we put that in there. So if 4% have it, 400 of them have it. Out of 10,000 total, it means 9,600 don't have it, so we put a number in there. Then we can fill in the rows, right? Because the rows reflect the sensitivity and specificity, okay? So we know the test is 97% sensitive. And you remember sensitivity is the probability that you'll test positive given you have it, right? So we know they have it. There's 400 cats that have it. What's the probability that they test positive? 97%. So 97% of 400, 0.97 times 400 is 388. Okay, which leaves 12 to test negative. Okay, so that they add up to 400. The specificity is used for the next row, right? The specificity is the prob probability that they are test negative given they don't have it. So that's 94%. So 94% of the 9,600, so 0.94 times 9,600 is 9,024, which leaves 576 cats to test positive um, even though they don't have FELV. And once we've filled in the section, we can then work out the totals, okay? And once we've got the totals, we've got everything, we can work out any probability that we like. In particular, we can work out the conditional probability given a positive test result, so that would be this column here, what is the chance that cat has FELV? So it would be 388 divided by 964, okay? So 388 divided by 964 is 0.4, so 40 percent. So given a positive test result, there's a 40 percent chance the cat has FELV, and a 60 percent chance that they don't have FELV. That's known as the positive predictive value of the test, or the PPV. Okay, I'm sure that um, Art probably mentioned this in the first half of the course. Okay.
Um, we could also assess what, what happens if we get a negative test result. So given a negative test result, what's the chance that the cat doesn't have FELV? Uh, we'd just be using the test negative column, so we know it's a negative result, and it would just be um, 9,024 divided by 9,036, which is very close to 1, right, 0 0.999. That's the negative predicted value of the test. Okay, so if you get a negative result from your FELV test, then you can be very confident that the cat doesn't have FELV. Whereas if you get a positive result from the test, you can only be 40% confident that the cat has FELV. So the sensitivity and specificity in the example were high, but the positive predictive value was low at only 40%. And the reason is because the prevalence was low, right? The overall prevalence was only 4%. And so there's very few. Um, so, you know, if you're comparing your positives, your positives are a combination of your true positives, which is a proportion of a very small number of cats that are positive for FELV because the prevalence is low. And then you've got your false positives, which is a small proportion because the test is very uh, specific of a large number of cats. So you're comparing a large proportion of a small number of cats to a small proportion of a very large number of cats. And often those small and large things sort of cancel each other out and you end up comparing numbers that are quite similar and so your positive predictive value ends up being, um, you know, fairly pathetic at about 50% or perhaps lower. Okay. Now, the key is that this doesn't mean the test is useless. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is um, in lecture three. You might want to think about why that is, perhaps use some of the information that you've learned from epidemiology um, and sort of note down why that might be.